This is always such an exciting time for us at, at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies because um, we love to talk about contract data and what they tell us. I uh, uh, want to welcome those of you here in the room. Um, I'm David Berto. I'm the director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group and a senior vice president here at CSIS. Uh, with me is Greg Sanders, who is our uh, uh, resident fellow uh, for all of our data analysis and data management work. Uh, Greg has been involved in this project since its inception. Um, I also want to welcome our viewers on the web. Uh, if you're on the web, you can access uh, the um, slides that we're going to use here today. You won't see the slides on the screen, but we'll tell you the slide number, and uh, you can go to them uh, if you're looking uh, on the website with the uh, telecast or the webcast, you can see under files uh, up in the top right-hand corner are the slides. You can also, if you're on the web, access the report, uh, which everybody in the room has with them. We'll, we'll be referring to the page numbers in the report as well as the chart numbers for those where the chart is actually in the report as well. And you can download the report also on the upper right under publications. It'll take you a couple of clicks to get through to the download, but, uh, but you can get the report as well. Um, I would uh, also ask those of you in the room to silence your phones. Um, if you're on the web, you can do whatever you want with your phones, I suppose. Uh, there are a lot of folks that we owe gratitude and thanks for in bringing this effort together. Um, the analysis we do on the uh, services industrial base is really pretty complex and, and takes a long time. I want to thank particularly uh, Jesse Ellman. Uh, and Reese McCormick, who are uh, the lead uh, um, analysts, uh, or especially in the end game here, uh, Ryan Crotty, who's essential to bringing us to, uh, to success at the end, uh, Andy Dodzatan, who's been involved in this project for several cycles now. Uh, I want to give some additional thanks to uh, Joshua Archer, Adam Parker, uh, who were involved, uh, especially on our projections. This is the first time we've started to do projections, which is a risky territory for us. Uh, we also have a few departed uh, research assistants and associates who are involved in this. I, I suspect they're all more happily doing less data work now, but uh, uh, Snehan uh, Raghavan, uh, Luke Hesselden, and uh, Tomoyo Nishimori, and all the folks who help us put on the event here this morning, Nicole Darden, Sam Brothers, uh, Alex Stevenson, Adam Schwartzman, and uh, T.J. Cipolletti. Uh, but in particular, I want to dedicate this report to our friend and colleague, our mentor and our guiding light in this field, the late Guy Benari. Um, Guy was uh, uh, the deputy director of DIG for years. Uh, he predated even Greg in terms of work on these uh, projects. Uh, we miss him every day, but we especially uh, miss him when we're involved in what he loved and did so well, which is to find the links between data and analysis and policy and outcomes. And so, Guy, this one really is for you. Um, usually this is where I say next chart, but I actually have the responsibility for doing that myself, so let me see if I know how to do that. Hey, hey, there's the next chart. Um, Greg Sanders will walk us through the methodological points that uh, actually affect our analysis. There's a lot in our methodology. It's, uh, you can read a lot more in the details, both in the report itself, pages one and two, and the appendix, but in many cases, each chart has some additional methodological points in the, uh, in the analysis that are relevant to that particular chart. Greg, you want to add a few highlights? So the main point to remember is that these are prime contracts. Subcontracts are tracked, but only a small portion of them still. And that data is relatively recent only. Um, reporting requirements are 2,500 or higher. Several departments are not included, including the Postal Service, CIA, NSA, um, and similarly classified contracts are not obligated to be reported, and we take that to mean most of them are not. Um, contract classifications will sometimes vary between how the government reports it and how companies report it and other vendors. Some of it will just be different classification schemes. Some of it will be the subcontract issue. All dollars are 2012 constant. And finally, I should note, this data includes supplementals and OCOs. Those are not separately categorized under FPDS. Methodologically, we always make a number of small changes. We'll speak to them if they're appropriate. The biggest ones were in competition, where we're now in line with DOD reporting. 
I, I should note also that the Federal Procurement Data System continually improves and updates its past data. Um, each year, one of the things we look at is how much money did we spend on Y2K, and each year that amount goes down. Um, so only by small amounts, but uh, um, you know, you would think that somewhere along the way it would stabilize. Um, let's look at the overall picture. This chart, this is on, uh, uh, this is chart three, if you're following along the charts, it's on page five in your, in your report. This is really the total context in which we look at federal services uh, contracts, if you will. And the chart is pretty complicated, so let me walk you through it. The, each bar is actually what we call total discretionary government spending. And it's, it's essentially composed of three elements. The green in the chart at the top is outlays, federal government outlays not under contract. So this would typically be salaries and grants and other discretionary funded programs. The red in the middle is federal contract spending on products, and the blue at the bottom is federal contract spending on services. I should note one other methodological point. In the federal procurement data system, research and development is categorized as a service. And so in this report, we include R&D as services. We break it out separately. In some of the specific reports we do, for instance, for the Defense Department or the Department of Homeland Security, we break out R&D separately from services because we view R&D, particularly in, in hardware-focused agencies, as an investment account more than as a service contract. And so we break those out separately. But for this report, R&D is included uh, in, in services, if you will. The, non-contract outlays is actual outlays and so it's you can't track directly from these totals to the amount appropriated for that year right contracts is contracts obligations so in services much of that money will be current year appropriations but some of that money will be prior year unobligated balances or in the case of overseas contingency operations money that could come from almost any previous year and so this is our methodology for calculating a total from which we look at the percentage. And so it's outlays uh, not on contracts and obligations under contracts. It's pretty unique to CSIS, but it tracks pretty closely with appropriated funds uh, records within uh, a matter of only a fraction of a percent, if you will. Um, so total federal spending, as defined in the chart, is down. You can see that the peak uh, was FY10. That's the tallest bar here, and, uh, and it, it's down uh, uh, about um, uh, from uh, 1.4 billion in FY12 dollars in 2010 to about 1.3 billion in FY11, so uh, FY12. So that's a slight decline. That's up, by the way, from a base of 800 billion back in FY2000 in constant dollars. So it went up from one point from 800 billion to 1.4 billion, down to 1.3 in FY12. We don't have FY13 data yet. Obviously, there's still three a month left in this fiscal year. Um, and it lags, but we'll be reporting out as quickly as we can on 13. What about the services contracts portion of this? Okay, here again, it's also down in real dollar terms from 356 billion in FY09, 351 billion in 10, down to 304 billion basically, or 308 billion in 12. Um, in percentage, it's also down uh, as a percent of total federal spending. Uh, services contracts are down from uh, 27% in 2009 to 24% in 2012. And as a percent of contract obligations, services contracts is also down. In other words, service contracts have been declining faster than contracts for products. Uh, services contracts were 62% of total federal contract dollars in 2009, down to 60% in 12. Now, all of this predates sequestration. Right. So the data don't yet show the impact in FY13. Um, there are two stories in that decline, though, between the peak in 9 and 10 and the decline in 12. The first is a reduction in stimulus, the uh, um, uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, right, which was really responsible for a good bit of the increase in 09 and 10 across the federal government. Most of that reduction, though, took place between 10 and 11, and because many of those contracts were finished by the end of fiscal year 11. The cuts between 11 and 12 are really driven by spending cuts that have been uh, coming out, out of the U.S. Congress. Still, in the long haul, contracts have gone up more over this entire period from 2000 to 2012 than total federal spending has. So contract dollars have been increased more. In the last three years, they've been de decreasing more. But what does the future hold? Uh, in previous reports, we did not undertake to project future contract dollars, but this year we did. 
Um, and in part, it was because we believe that the story told in this report is not the end of the story. That in fact, the impact from FY13 cuts under sequestration uh, are only only begun to be hinted at here. And of course, there's the real questions of what happens in 14 and 15. So here we project uh, on the right-hand side, both for overall federal spending at the top and for services contracts with the blue line that's uh, near the bottom there, um, what could happen beyond uh, 13, 14, and into 15. Um, 13, we're, we've got a pretty clear projection because we, we know the sequestration hit on March 1st and we reflect that here. And so our projection is based on just on the trends uh, and the percentages of total federal spending is that uh, services contracts will decline measurably further in FY13. The question of what happens in 14 and 15 is entirely a question of whether or not the Congress appropriates funds and modifies the Budget Control Act so that spending would be at higher levels or whether in fact we operate either on a continuing resolution or an appropriation that's consistent with the Budget Control Act. So the higher number uh, or the higher line of the projections would be in, in the event of a modification to the Budget Control Act and appropriations at a level with the House and Senate budget resolutions and the President's budget. The lower dotted lines, both for federal spending and for services contracts, reflects what happens if you actually comply with the Budget Control Act. Um, those of you who have been to our other events on the budget know that, uh, that most of us who are involved in this here at CSIS see very little opportunity for the votes to be there uh, to not have the spending come down to the Budget Control Act level for 14 and for 15. Um, but uh, and so these these projections uh, take that in, into account. Uh, Greg, do you want to comment at all on the methodology here? So we've looked at a couple of different models, and the basic story will be the same. This model is based on what percent goes to the um, services contracting based over, done over discretionary. If and we do a time series analysis. If you just took the 2012 percentage and projected it forward you'd have a roughly similar story. The error bars are fairly large, 1.5% plus or minus as a percentage of total discretionary spending, or 15 to 20 billion plus or minus. However, even with those very large error bars, and even with the fact that the CBO projections we use for total discretionary are just that projections, there's a lot that could change, we seem unlikely to return to past peaks and at the lower end of possible analysis, we're going down to levels that we only saw at the middle of this past decade. I should, uh, I should note that this chart is actually in the executive summary of the report uh, on Roman numeral page six. Uh, uh, we've put a fairly robust executive summary together, uh, and we'll probably end up printing that as, and releasing that as a separate document for ease of circulation and removal of printing bulk. Um, let's go back to the history then, the last fiscal year. This chart, this is page six in your report, and it's chart five if you're following along in the charts, uh, shows uh, total federal uh, contract obligations for service contracts by government agency. Uh, not surprisingly, the Defense Department is still the biggest piece. That's the uh, blue piece down at the bottom, uh, 187 billion. It's still 60% of total services contracts, uh, but it is down from a peak of 220 billion in 09 and 62 percent. So as both as in terms of total dollars, DOD is down, and as a percentage of total government services contracts, DOD is down, and that's continuing to decline. There's actually a three-year declining compound average growth rate. It's funny to talk about a declining growth rate, but it is a declining growth rate uh, of over 5 percent per year in, uh, in DOD. And there's almost no uh, uh, stimulus money included in that decline because DOD barely got a billion dollars worth of stimulus uh, money in the, in the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, it's useful to look at some of the other agencies as well, just to go through them very quickly. Health and Human Services is up on an average of 2 percent per year over the last three years, but every other agency is, that we report here is declining. Uh, DOE is down an average of 8.5 percent per year, DHS down an average of 6 percent per year, the State Department and AID down 3 percent per year, NASA down 1 percent per year. And GSA is down 15 percent per year. Greg, you might want to expand a little bit on the GSA data here. So part of this is a change in GSA reporting methodology. They have dropped much of their lease contract reporting from FPDFs. We have cross-verified by their other reporting that GSA is not out of the lease business, uh, and we have spoken with them. The short version is that 
they are not required by law to report uh, that information to FPDS. They are allowed to do it. It's in a category that is optional. Um, and the fact that they're no longer doing it does greatly reduce the transparency because if we look at you know, their past levels, if we look at what they've reported elsewhere, that's on the order of 40% of their service contract obligations and two-thirds of their obligations in the facility-related service and construction category. So this change should not be taken in the slightest to be representative of a change in the underlying data. It's very much reporting, and we think it's a reporting change for the worst um, based on the fact that it's not as good for uh, comparing the past, and it just means that the visibility is lower. And facility services uh, contracts for GSA is not a trivial chunk of change, so it's a pretty important uh, uh, change in methodology. I should note that, you know, you can't really tell it from this chart, but when we get to the back and you look agency by agency, each agency hits its peak at a different year, and so measuring the decline from the peak, um, you have to look at each agency on a case-by-case on -case basis. Let's look now across the federal government by what we call service areas, right? This is uh, uh, our breakdown of the categories of federal procurement data system reporting, the FPDS reporting. Uh, the appendix in the report gives you all of the crosswalk, if you will. And we've been able to crosswalk our data to each agency's own separate reporting. DOD, for instance, has its little categories that it uses for, uh, for services contracts, and we can crosswalk the data back and forth quite adequately uh, to theirs. Greg, could you walk us through the six categories here and some of the key highlights? Certainly. So, as I previously mentioned, um, facility-related services and construction declined in large part due to GSA, um, but also due to a decline in the DOD that's not due to a reporting change. Um, so that's largely in building construction, though some of that is a change in the way they're categorizing things. Um, In R&D, again, DOD is the main source of decline from about $39 billion in 2011 to 35 in 2012. Uh, space was particularly hard hit, uh, the applied research areas. And we also saw declines in aircraft, electronics communications, and general engineering. Professional, administrative, and managerial services. This can be both a high-end and a somewhat catch-all category. There has, in fact, been an attempt to move away from some of the broader categories, like other professional services, although despite that, there's a slight increase in that categorization. Um, there, the majority of the decline, again, comes from DOD, a decline of 9%. Um, there's been a drop in management support services, which was a goal of OMB. They had been hoping to reduce it by 15%, However, the actual fall was only by 10%. Equipment-related services um, was actually a rare area where there has been a slight uptick. Um, so it gained more than $5 billion, and equipment-related services is almost completely dominated by the Department of Defense. So we're talking Department of Defense, so major platforms, et cetera. Um, Information and communications technology, they peaked in 2011, and then have declined slightly, again, DOD. Um, and the big six have actually been declining in ICT faster than other categories. Um, big six major defense contractors, that is. We'll talk about them more later. Um, medical obligations did decline slightly. Uh, however, they are still left with the 2012 value that's higher than any pre-2011 peak value. Um, and again, these categorizations are all done by product or service codes. And if you ever want any more detail on that, that's contained in the report, and we're happy to talk about them in detail. I should note also that uh, we, we have actually been encouraging the Defense Department for a number of years to look carefully at what they were categorizing as a product contract, which was really equipment-related services. So you had aircraft support contracts, for instance, that were categorized in FPDS as a product because it was an airplane. 
Um, but to us, it's a service because, in fact, it's a logistic support contract. And uh, it could be that part of the increase in, in the Defense Department's equipment-related services report is, is a reporting shift, or more accurate reporting, if you will. To do that, we have to look at each individual contract, and, and, and we break down after a, a couple of hundred of those and quit looking because there are simply too many. We spent a lot of time on uh, competition in our report. This chart is not in your, in your report, but it basically lets you see how we crosswalk from the 17 categories of competition that, that uh, OFPP includes in the guidance for uh, federal procurement data system down to the four categories, basically, of contracts that we look at, competition with multiple offers, competition with a single offer, no competition, and what we euphemistically refer to as unlabeled, which often means some data are missing. Like, for instance, it might say it's a competitive contract, it was awarded and nobody bid. Um, we usually think that falls in the category of a labeling problem or a data entry problem. Um, and this is what, what the data show. This is uh, uh, in your report is, uh, uh, page 8 in the report, and it's chart 8 in, in the categories, if you will. Um, basically, what these data show is that um, no competition across the federal government, the category of no competition, was 20% in 2011. It's 21% in 2012. Competition with multiple offers, kind of a success story, 62% of all competitive, this is by dollars, all contract obligations uh, in services contracts, 62% were awarded under competition with multiple offers in 2011, stable, same percentage in 2012. The bottom line is there is still considerable room for additional competition in services contracts. Right. We have a similar flow chart that breaks down for what we call funding mechanism, cost reimbursable, time and materials, fixed price contracts. FPDS has uh, all these categories, 17, we break it down into five, fixed price, cost reimbursement, time and materials. I want to focus a little bit on the category we call combination because this, by FPDS definition, could be something that's a combination of fixed price and cost reimbursable. This does not mean that there are not combination contracts in the other categories. The guidance is pretty clear. The data enterer is supposed to categorize a contract as fixed price, cost reimbursable, et cetera, based upon what best fits the preponderance of the contract line item numbers and the deliverables under that contract. So you could have a contract that has 60 CLINs in it, for instance, 55 of which are fixed price, five of which are cost reimbursable. Presumably the data enterer will conclude that falls in the category of a fixed price contract, but it is possible they could say, well, this is a combination, so we put it in combination contracts. This is important distinction when we look at what the data actually show us. Here's the data. If you um, um, look in your report on page 10 and your uh, um, charts also on chart 10, uh, and I want to focus on a couple things here. One is fixed price contracts, which is your blue bar at the bottom. 48% uh, of all contract obligations under services contracts were fixed price in 2011, up slightly 49% in 2012, and cost reimbursement was steady at 43%. But look back a little bit at the data in 09 and 10. You'll see that the category of other and the category of combination, the purple at the top, uh, you can see in the, in the years 06, 07, uh, 08, 09, that purple combination was growing substantially so that by 2009, you had about 40, 40 50 billion dollars worth of combination contracts. Um, we were, as we were doing our analysis, noting this to OFPP and GSA, and, uh, and there was guidance went out that basically said, quit putting so much in combination, figure out where it actually goes. So you can actually see a pretty substantial increase in fixed price contracts between 09 and 10, um, and a slightly smaller increase in cost reimbursable contracts between 09 and 10, even as the total came down a bit. Almost all of that, those increases correlate highly. Now, we haven't looked at each individual contract, so we can't say that it's pure cause and effect, but they correlate very highly with the reduction, dramatic reduction in reporting as a combination contract. So what looks like an increase in fixed price contracting and a slight increase in cost reimbursable is actually probably just better reporting of the data. Um, and, and the subsequent years, uh, 11 and 12, which show essentially flat both in terms of percentage of obligation dollars uh, in fixed price contracts and percentage in um, uh, cost reimbursable are essentially flat. So we think that uh, um, this is a fairly stable environment, if you will. Inside each contract, of course, there's a lot of different dynamics going on. This just reflects the, the overall data, if you will. 
we, by the way, uh, are unable to um, determine from FPDS what contracts were awarded under categories like low price technically acceptable. There's no field that allows you to, to pursue the data and analyze it based on, on that sort of category, if you will. Let's look now by, uh, uh, and again, we're across the whole federal government, by contract vehicle. Greg? So contract vehicle. Um, we have, uh, what, six different, five different categories yes. here. And page 11 um, and also chart 11. So this is the first year we've actually gotten our contract vehicles from the raw data, which will allow us to crosswalk them with other sections. And you'll see that a little bit later. Um, Definitive contracts and purchase orders, uh, your traditional awards, um, have both been down, but in, they're down in rough proportion with the overall decline. Uh, purchase orders saw their peak early in this past decade and have not really come back. Though if you looked at this at a contract action level, they're much larger. Um, single award um, indefinite delivery contracts are down. Multi-award have been growing throughout this period. There's still only a relatively small portion. It's that light blue bar, but they've been steadily increasing and we're likely to see uh, if, Paul, if trends remain as they have been, uh, further increases at least as a share in the future. Um, they similarly have been taking away some market share from single award IDCs and from um, FSS, uh, Federal Supply Service, and other uh, government-wide vehicles and the like. Um, the Unlabeled vehicles have been declining. They decline even a little bit more if you use alternate sources. We have a slight increase in unlabeled based on the new method we're using, but it still remains very small. So one of the big drivers of multi-award contracts is that because you have a pre-approved group of vendors, they are somewhat simpler to run as contracts. And that can be very useful for some purposes, namely, if you have, since you have very limited contract or officer time, et cetera. Um, though we also can introduce other complications, and we're gonna speak about that more later in the report. All right, we're gonna look at competition statistics by each of these contract categories, but the real takeaway here is the dramatic, most of the decline in spending has been reflected in decline in definitive contracts for, for um, services contracts. Much, uh, a higher percentage is still moving towards uh, um, the uh, uh, delivery order type contracts. Let's look now at, at contract obligations by the size of the vendor or the company, if you will. Here we have four categories, and this is the first time we've brought the big six uh, government contractors in as a category for our services contracts, if you will. Um, the four categories are essentially small business down at the bottom, and that's as defined by, by the federal small business set-aside standards. Um, medium businesses uh, in, in the middle, large, which we define as more than $3 billion a year in total annual revenue from all sources. And then the big six uh, at the top are obviously part of large, but we break them out as a separate category. So really the definition of middle is bigger than small and smaller than $3 billion a year. Um, and that, that we made a change a few years ago from a billion a year to $3 billion a year, um, largely because if we look at competition, um, there's a break point in who competes at about the $3 billion a year level as opposed to the billion dollar a year level. So what do the data show us here? What they show us is that just in the last year, between 11 and 12, overall service contracts are down about 7%, right? For small businesses, it's only down 5%. So small businesses have been more than holding their own in a declining services contracts market. Medium-sized businesses down 8%, so slightly more than the market decline overall. Large businesses down 9%, and the big six are only down 3%. So the two groups that are protecting their market share are actually growing their market share in a declining market are small businesses and the big six contracting firms. The big six, by the way, are Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, um, Boeing, and, uh, and BAE Systems. Um, so as a percentage now, you have a, a pretty careful breakout. Uh, uh, the big six are 16%. Small business is 21%. Medium-sized businesses are 30% of total services contract dollars across the government, and large businesses are 33%. Those numbers are contained in the report. Do you want to add something, Greg? Yes. So one factor behind the small keeping its own share might be the fact that our small reporting looks at all services contracts. Federal government small business requirements look only at contracts performed in the United States for other standards. 
but that's one of the big ones. So as you see a decline in contingency contracts, the percentage um, that are subject to small business requirements will go up. So don't expect our numbers to exactly match federal reporting numbers. That's because we're looking at different numbers. That is not because the federal numbers are inaccurate or our numbers are inaccurate. We, we also make one other adjustment. Um, we, we actually do companies by DUNS codes, right? So we, we track uh, the contract dollars by the DUNS codes. And, uh, and government regulations and rules allow when a larger company acquires a small company, that small company retains its small business set-aside capability generally for two years, right? And government reports and takes credit for small business set-asides during those two years. We discount them as soon as the deal is done. We basically, once the DUNS code is transferred over, um, we start counting it as the category of the parent company that has acquired the small business. So our small business numbers are actually a little bit lower than government's numbers uh, as a result of that. But we think they reflect the reality of actual contract awards and, uh, and where the revenue is flowing, if you will. Let's now look at contract size, if you will. Um, Greg? So contract this size. This is uh, what, chart 13 and page 13. Yes. A remarkable uh, continuity here. Contract size is based on annual obligations. So we're looking at how much goes out for the contract in a single year rather than the total life of a contract. Um, and the, break, the changes have actually not shown a clear bend. Um, so the particularly small contracts, so 250,000 a year or less, have actually dropped off dramatically between 2011 and 2012 at about 40 percent. You also see a less dramatic but still higher than overall drop change in the 100 million to 500 million category, while the greater than 500 million say relatively constant, a 3% drop. The implications of this you'll see a little bit more when we look later at competition by contract size. One of the main complaints we'll regularly hear from small or medium vendors is that they cannot compete for particularly large contracts. And um, you'll see later, but that complaint seems to be borne out in terms of the market shares to be received. I have a, uh, uh, a comment to make on the previous chart as well in terms of size. There's actually one vendor or one service provider missing from this chart, and that's the federal government itself. Um, unfortunately, we're bound by, to analyze only that for which we have data. There's no good source of data on how much the government itself spends on its own services. Um, and uh, either by agency or by category, if you will, R&D, uh, uh, professional administrative and managerial uh, facilities related services, et cetera. To do a really excellent analysis would require us to have better government spending data by all the same categories. Um, I note on this chart we don't have those, but uh, if we did, um, both the magnitude of the chart and the scale uh, would vary considerably. So. Um, but let's look at those vendors we can identify, and that is the, uh, the, the contractors, if you will. Um, this chart, which is uh, page 14 in your report and chart 14, is the top 20 federal service contractors by prime contract dollars as reported. We have 2002 on the left, we have 2012 on the right, and for convenience, we give you in 2002 the 2001 rank of those companies on the 2002 side. And for 2011, uh, for 2012, we'll give you the 2011 rank on the right-hand side. You can actually see a fair amount of stability here. Four of the top five are the same in, uh, in, in each of those uh, years. Uh, that is the same at the beginning of our data in 2000 as it is in, in 2012. But in the overall composition of the top 20, there are several significant changes, if you will. Every contractor in this category received that more than a billion dollars in contract obligations uh, in three or more service areas. So equipment, facilities, uh, professional administrative and managerial. So every contractor here is spread across all of the contract areas. We have a lot of more detail of that uh, in, in our report, if you will. Um, one of the interesting shifts, of course, you see is the presence on the uh, right-hand side of three of the DOD healthcare providers companies in the top 20 services contracts, if you will. And back in 2000, only one was in the top 20. This shows the shift in spending into, uh, into DOD and military health care, uh, military beneficiaries and retirees and dependents, as well as active duty and, and reserve service members. Um, and that shift is reflected in this top 20. I should note that every one of these companies reports a different number. 
than the number here because this is not the total uh, contract dollars that they get on services. This is prime contract dollars. We can't adjust for either dollars that each of these companies gains uh, as a sub to another prime or dollars that they then transfer to a sub in their own prime contracts. So many of the companies here will have very different numbers than the ones we report. This, this is, however, what the public database uh, reports for each of your companies if you're on this list. So, um, Let me now look at competition. I'm going to refresh your memory. This chart we had up before, this is uh, uh, page 15 in your report, and we had it much earlier. Oh, I don't know. I actually remember where it is on the report because um, I don't have that on my data here. But this was basically the one that shows that full competition with multiple offers is, is uh, uh, stable as a percentage, declining as total dollars, and, uh, and that there is ample opportunity for competition. So let's look now at competition by some of the categories. Um, this is competed awards. Um, by number of offers received by contract vehicle type. So the left-hand side is definitive contracts, and the colors, if you will, are basically the dark blue at the bottom is a single offer. So only a small percentage of definitive contracts were competed and only had a single offer. A much higher percentage were competed with two offers. It's, it's over a third of total definitive contract dollars. Um, three to four offers is another uh, uh, fourth of the total, if you will, and then multiple offers, including um, an indiscernible or very small number that had 25 or more offers for a, de a single definitive contract, if you will. Um, it's a very different story in the other types of categories. Purchase orders have, not surprisingly, substantially more uh, single offer contracts, if you will, more than a third of, of uh, purchase order contracts. For the, for the delivery order type contracts, single award IDCs and multiple award IDCs, as well as for the federal supply schedule and others, um, there are really two layers of competition reflected here. Because obviously there was competition to get on the vehicle in the first place, and then there's competition for the individual awards. This only reflects the second category of those competition for individual awards. And so what often looks like a single offer is really a single offer inside an existing competitive uh, vehicle uh, on which companies are, are, are sitting, if you will. But, uh, but it's instructive to look at the difference of the data by the different types of contract vehicles. We'll be glad to expand on this a little bit. Let's now look at uh, contract size. Greg? So contract size, um, you'll see Definitive had a very large share of two offers. That's because many of the greater than 500 million annual obligations contracts are Definitive. So you can see that 61% of competitions with um, very large contracts only get two offers. This is relatively straightforward phenomenon. These are service contracts that involve particular specialties and the like. But at the same time, it's possible that if they were broken up or structured differently, they might be open to competition by more vendors. Sim uh, you also see a lot of single offer competition is focused at the lower end of sizes. That is probably a salutary effect of oversight in that the larger contracts are, the more attention they tend to get and the more effort is put towards making sure there's multiple competition. In any number of categories where we've looked, we found that high attention ones are more likely to avoid single offer. So as I mentioned when we were looking at the chart on page 8 on competition, the bottom line here is there's still considerable room for additional competition. Of course, it's in a declining market and uh, at, uh, at potentially more competitive rates and prices. And that was page 77, I should say. We then look a little bit at the varying values, if you will, by the size of the vendor, small, medium, large, and the big six in terms of size of contract? So let me walk you through this. Is, this might be a little off-putting. We are on page very pretty 79. looking chart, though. So this is by to this is an absolute spend chart. So you can see that from less than 250, at 5 million or lower, small businesses get the largest market share. As you get up to 5 million to 25 million, medium takes the lead. Small is still there, but they're starting to drop off. As you get to 25 million to 100 million, large crosses small. And this is large excluding big six. Um, and big six is steadily rising in each of these categories. And small really starts to drop off. Sorry, large crosses medium. As you get up to 100 
million to 500 million, medium is dropping off, and the big six vendors, big six DOD vendors, in and of themselves, have about the same amount of revenue as all medium vendors in that category. Um, finally, as you get to greater than 500 million, you have a small number of medium vendors still. Um, those are probably going to be largely dedicated government firms because that's going to be a big chunk of their revenue for a given year. Um, but large firms and big six just dominate the category completely. So while multi-award contracts do seem to be able to get competition and multiple offers as they get steadily larger, the complaint that very large contracts have fewer offers and are open to a smaller pool of contract vendors is borne out by the data. So the bottom line is that small businesses tend to win the largest share of small contracts. Medium-sized businesses tend to win the largest share of medium-sized contracts, and large businesses tend to win the largest share of large contracts. That is not counterintuitive, but it's the first time we've actually looked at the data and made sure that they actually are consistent with what you would believe. Um, in the report, we cover a lot of detail for a host of government agencies. We're only going to go through three of them here in the interest of time, but we'd we'll be happy to answer questions on any of those. I should note as well that, um, that we're happy to have follow-up discussions on particular elements of this. Uh, you know, the, the richness of the data, we could run 500 charts through here. We wouldn't have any audience, of course, but, uh, but we could certainly do that. Um, but if you're interested in any particular piece of it, either our, our web viewers or, or those in the room, um, we're happy to uh, set up a time and arrange to come and brief you on particular elements of it, if you will, um, at a time of, of mutual convenience. So let's look at, at three agencies of particular interest. These are kind of eye charts, if you will. You've got the data in the uh, um, report as well. This is on page 43 uh, in the report, and it's chart 20 if you're following along. This is the Defense Department uh, services contract obligations by the various elements, the categories, if you will, the contract vehicle, the extent of competition, funding mechanism, and vendor size. A few key points. Greg already mentioned that equipment-related services for DOD actually showed moderate growth over the last few years despite an overall decline. So DOD in the last few years overall in services contracts is down 5% per year, but in equipment-related services it's up almost 6% per year. Right? Um, facilities services, on the other hand, is down over 11 percent per year. It's the biggest decline inside DOD spending. We see no indication for any change in that direction or, or magnitude going forward. Um, similar by vehicle, uh, multiple award IDCs in, in DOD is actually up about 1 percent per year over that three-year period. Um, and uh, um, other indefinite delivery vehicles are up almost 8 percent per year. So DOD's use of, of delivery order contracts for services contracts is actually growing while its use of definitive contracts and purchase orders is declining even more dramatically than the 5 percent per year average. A lot more detail inside here. Again, it's a bit of an eye chart. We'll just skim to a couple of those. Greg, you want to make a couple comments on, on the Department of okay, Homeland so the Department Security? Of Homeland Security. First off, uh, if you look, there's a spike. That can be attributed directly to Hurricane Katrina and uh, recovery efforts. Um, but So that's 06. But in more recent years, uh, they've actually had a dramatic improvement in the number of uh, contract obligations awarded with multiple offers, 38% uh, in 2009, 57% in 2012. Uh, they should also be credited over recent years for dramatically reducing their percentage of unlabeled uh, data. We've mentioned that before in our DHS report, uh, but they've really done a uh, comprehensive effort to improve things there and we should get credit for it. They have overall a slight decline. Um, PAMS is re uh, professional managerial, administrative and managerial services responsible for much of that. Multi-award um, indefinite delivery uh, contracts have actually been on the decline for DHS. So they're a bit of an outlier from the rest of government in that regard. This may be the first time that the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group has ever talked about the Department of Health and Human Services in any of our public briefings. But they're the one large agency in terms of federal services contract dollars that actually has been going up over the last three years. So we thought it was important to take a look at them and see what we could see. Greg. So page 51, uh, chart 22. Um, so they were the only one to increase. They have been fluctuating at about $13 billion. Um, and the big driver there has been information and communications technology, um, whereas R&D has actually been on the decline some. 
So that would be consistent with things like electronic medical records and the like. Um, now let's look uh, at the, each of the six service areas that we have. We're just going to briefly skim through these. These are all in, in the middle pages of your uh, report, 20, starting 20 and 21 and beyond. Um, Greg, why don't you run through each of them quickly. Tell me when you want me to click to the next sure. chart. So as we already mentioned, PEMS did, uh, did not meet the OMB goal of reducing the um, administrative support contracts. It peaked in 2010, so a little later than some of the other areas which peaked in 2009. And notably in PAMS, they should get credit for moving a fair number, in some areas, moving um, out of vague categorizations. We're now actually seeing categories for high interest topics like security contracting and the like, which previously fell under vague catch-alls, now have specific identifications. Right, next chart, please. Got it. Okay, so R&D, page 25, uh, chart 25. Um, so R&D contract obligations have declined. They peaked in 09, which followed with DOD in general. Um, and the big six have been declining steeply in that category. However, they're obviously still dominant. Um, so they went from 49% of R&D in 2009 to 42% in 2012. Uh, and I would note that uh, part of that is 2012 is the first year that you have Huntington Ingalls Industries separate from Northrop Grumman. And so part of it is you lost a chunk of the big six and Huntington Ingalls is still getting some R&D. Uh, contract dollars. Let's go to equipment related services. This is uh, chart 26 and it's page 28 in your report. Right. So if you look at the upper left of those charts, um, you can see just how dominated equipment related services is by DOD. Um, that's the pale green. Everything else is just a small pile on top. Um, so that was five billion in gains. Um, and similarly, you see a fair amount of definitive contracts. You see a lot of fixed price in this category. And you see a lot um, of uh, multi-offer competitions. So doing relatively well. Uh, large and big six in general also are fairly dominant here. Though the big six are not as dominant as they are in R&D. So we love this stuff, and we could go through chart after chart after chart, on and on and on. But I think at this point, it's probably time to call an end to the presentation, uh, to open both the floor to questions. Um, if you're watching on the web, you are welcome to email me questions at dberteau, B-E-R-T-E-A-U, at CSIS.org. And, uh, and we'll take questions. Uh, those of you in the room, we have, of course, our standard procedure. You raise your hand. Um, I will recognize you. You'll wait for the microphone. Uh, you'll take the microphone and, uh, and tell us your name and your uh, affiliation, and then proceed to, uh, to ask your questions. So uh, questions, oh, first of all, uh, here in the room. Right, questions or comments? You're not required to do so. Usually when I teach class, I say, you know, just because you don't ask questions doesn't mean you get out early. But uh, in, this, in this case, it, it actually might. Um, Sheila? Sheila Ronis from Walsh College. Um, as, as you know, we have been very concerned about the overall base and its long-term impact on national security and I was wondering if you would comment about the data you have just showed us and what you think the long-term implications of that are for um, securing our industrial base and, and more particular in services, the knowledge in the heads of next generations of people.
Ah, didn't have my microphone on. So if, if in fact, the, the um, uh, services are a separate industrial base that we need to pay attention to, then what's the composition of that, the skill base, et cetera? But if you look at the, the structure, if you will, and particularly you look at who's sustaining or growing their share in a declining market, it's two categories. It is, in fact, the large companies, especially the big six, and the small businesses, if you will. Um, so the, the question of how do you sustain the capability you need inside that industrial base in a declining set of dollars with market share that's becoming potentially a little more comp concentrated and with opportunities for more competition, none of that says that you're going to get to an endpoint that guarantees you maintain the capability and capacity you need to have. So the data that we have don't actually give you the answer to that question, but I think it highlights the need for better analysis at looking at it. The challenge, though, is the complete disparity of, of types of contracts that you have here. You know, the capability and, and competence you need, both at skill level and in terms of corporate capability for facilities-related services is so dramatically different than it is for professional administrative and management services. And embedded inside professional administrative and management, you have everything ranging from what's prohibited by law, personal services contracts, but which in fact probably happens anyway, uh, to really high-end, uh, you know, unique qualifications, uh, highly qualified individuals uh, that the government itself has a great deal of difficulty competing and, and, and succeeding in bringing them in as a, as a career civil servant. Um, and so you, it cuts across that range. I don't really know how to answer the question, but I think we have the start of a good package to, uh, to deal with it, if you will. I think we had, let's have one question here. I think we had another one over on the side here. Um, Hang on for the mic. Thank you. Uh, does your data include OCO money? And uh, also, where are things like logistic services or training? And which one of the, you know, which categories are those? The, the data do include uh, uh, overseas contingency operations. Uh, um, however, we don't have the ability through the federal procurement data system data entry uh, to distinguish the source of funds. And so you could have a mix of funds, both from general operation and maintenance funding accounts and overseas contingency operation, similar for R&D, et cetera. And, and by agency, they don't, they don't break it down as well. In terms of uh, other, the second question, Greg? Professional, administrative, and managerial services. Would have uh, both logistics both and logistics and training. Yeah, um, and in general, where there's been some categories where, like transportation, of like where we have to break out things between people and equipment. When it's people matter, we normally will put it in professional, administrative, and managerial. So if there was a moving items logistics side, uh, that might fall under equipment. But almost all of what you're talking about is PAMS. Other and questions? So some of the decline you see is declining contingency yeah. contracting. Rich? Uh, Rich McFarland from Parsons. Uh, immense amount of data, <laughs> which is just fantastic. Uh, two observations that I think I am wondering if you've seen any data on this. One is that, uh, and I'm thinking in terms of the unpredictability of the budget environment is that I've seen, we're seeing our customers go into a recompete mode rather than a new work mode. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is that it gives them the ability to have some control out of, over their uh, budget execution. Uh, so I was wondering if you all were seeing those kinds of trends there in, in the data that, that you're seeing. Um, and the second thing that, that comes to mind for me is the sheer, um, I guess enormity of the data. I I'm, I, I struggle with uh, how to forecast the future with with this uh, with this information because I see what I think I'm seeing is a, a declining market, uh, one characterized by recompetition, and therefore new work is not going to be offered, uh, and that's really where companies are getting there. It becomes a takeaway rather than competing for new work, and therefore the ability to grow becomes much more uh, intense and difficult to do because you're simply taken away from your, your competitors. So there seems to be a convergent line someplace. Have you, is any of that kind of information uh, reflected in your data, or did you see any of that kind of inf those kind of trends there? Let me take a crack at, at, uh, at both of those. Um, 
Thank you, Rich, for, for that. I, I, on the question of, of essentially recompete, I assume you mean um, uh, opening up a, a, a contract for competition when you actually have option years that could still be exercised as, as opposed to uh, uh, starting a competition before its time, if you will. We've heard stories of that. Um, I don't think we've looked at the data. I'm not sure, Greg, whether, in fact, inside FPDS, we'd really have to go contract by contract back to the previous award, see how many option years were in the previous award, and, uh, and then look at whether it's recompeted sooner than that. Um, I, I would be hopeful that there would be a better data source than going through 850,000 contract actions a year to try to figure that out, um, because I haven't figured out how to automate that yet. But, um, uh, but it, is a, it, it is a serious question, I think, from a competitive marketplace, if you will. Uh, and it could skew the competition numbers. So I think it would, it would behoove us at least to do a sample and see what, uh, what we see there in terms of, of large contracts and, and whether, I, I'm not quite sure how you'd tell a trend or not. Uh, in terms of future, though, I think that's, a, that, that's something where we've set ourselves up here for, for a, a pretty good assessment. Uh, the real questions, I think, are, are twofold. One is what's actually happening in FY13. We have some preliminary data for the first couple of uh, quarters, if you will, uh, but the real impact of sequestration probably won't show up in those because there's only one month of, of sequestration in, that, in those data. Um, and I think the, the issue of what's going to happen in the fourth quarter is still kind of out there, if you will. Uh, we're seeing, at least in initial reports for, uh, for July, which is the first month of the fourth quarter, a substantial decline in obligation rates in contracts uh, in July over both July to July, so the July of the previous year, and June to July, month over month, substantial decline across the federal government in all types of contracts. Uh, we'll get the August data a week from today. Uh, the uh, 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 Treasury Department puts out its, its monthly obligation data, contract obligation data, on the 10th of the month. So we're going to look very closely to see whether that decline continued in August, both in terms of month over month and, and year over year by month. Um, and then, of course, September will be the real issue because you have, you have sort of two new competing dynamics, if you will, uh, to the traditional. Uh, the tradition is obviously if you've got money left in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year, you spend it. Right? And, and, and a lot of us tend to have a disproportionately large share of our bookings and revenue come from that, from that end of year spending, not dramatically disproportional, but more than, uh, than a one-fourth share. Um, but there are two countervailing uh, dynamics going on right now. One is, in fact, for the first time in a long time, there's actually a benefit in the government to not spending the money. Um, because you've got something else that you can use it for, if you will, uh, under sequestration. And the second is the impact, particularly in the Defense Department, of furloughs and in the furlough mentality working to the rule of you only work eight hours a day, you don't work overtime, you don't bring your BlackBerry home and work from, the, from home on the weekends. Um, we've seen a, a throughput problem, if you will, of essentially it's just harder to get uh, uh, contracts uh, uh, out, solicited, uh, evaluated, awarded, and, and get funds obligated. Um, and so those competing dynamics are having, I think, a depressing effect, at least from the initial data in July. We'll have to see what, what August and September show. That's just for 13. Then the question is how much of that gets replicated into fiscal year 14. Uh, we put out a, a document here back in, in the spring where we called fiscal year 13 the lost year in the defense budget, and I think in some ways that's true across the federal government, although a little bit less true because the impact of sequestration is less on domestic uh, discretionary funded agencies than it is on the defense department. Um, the, we see very little sign of FY14 being anything other than a continuing resolution, essentially flat at the FY13 level. That, by the way, is not enough to get you to the Budget Control Act cap. You're going to have to take another $17 billion or so out of defense and another couple of billion out of domestic discretionary, uh, presumably in January. It's either 15 days after Congress adjourns or by the middle of January if Congress never adjourns, and I don't know what they're going to do. Um, so you'll see a kind of a double impact in, in FY14. And then the real question is, what's the FY15 budget submission going to be? As you know from both the OMB guidance and the DOD uh, post-skimmer guidance, as reflected by Secretary Hagel, uh, both government-wide and within the Defense Department, they're preparing two budgets, or three. One which assumes that the Budget Control Act is gone away by fiscal year 15 and that the government can get essentially its request, one that assumes the Budget Control Act is still in place, so it takes $100 billion out of that request, and one, at least in some agencies, that splits the difference. 
under uh, essentially compliant with the Senate budget resolutions levels. It's pretty hard to predict what any of this is going to look like because then you have to decide which one of those three budget levels. You know, they're not exactly high, medium, low, but relative to one another, they're high, medium, low. Uh, which one of those you're building your projections on? I think this is an incredibly difficult time for a company uh, to figure out uh, what its projections ought to be, and in part it's because it's an incredibly difficult time for the government to know where they're going to be. You know, you're literally all year have had been justifying a budget that is not the budget you're going to start executing in 28, 27 days, if we're lucky, if we're not shut down. So it's just awfully hard to project. So our projections actually show, you know, the upper and lower bound of that, but we really only carry it out to 15. Uh, it's very hard to see any scenario in which we return to what looked like normalcy even as much as a year and a half ago. That's an awful long answer to the question, but I think it, it deserves a pretty thorough uh, examination, if you will. Uh, Brad, you have comments? Uh, and in terms of reporting obligations, the report you can see out of CSS, so first can look at the civilian agencies for 2013, because the Department of Defense has a 90-day reporting delay. So we're probably going to be examining things like DHS or uh, diplomacy and development first, Full-on 2013 DOD analysis will probably only come in 2014. Yeah. I have a couple questions from the web that I'll uh, consolidate here, and then uh, then I have another question from the audience here. Um, basically, the questions are uh, uh, revolve around competition and the degree to which we've assessed uh, the record of competition for services compared to, say, competition for hardware, in terms of, uh, of both outcomes. And, uh, um, and one, one questioner calls it uh, the coherence and objectivity. Um, I don't actually have an objective way to measure coherence in, in the data that we have here. Uh, but I do think it, 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 is, uh, it, it does behoove us, actually Greg and I talked uh, in preparation for this uh, event this morning, of the need to look at the competition, particularly within the large agencies, uh, by the categories of, uh, of products and services and, and see what those data show us. And I think we're going to, we've got some preliminary data on that. We put a little of that out in our DOD report uh, a couple of years ago, or actually through FY12 last year, uh, or through FY11 last year, and we'll update that on the uh, DOD report. This is, I'm not quite certain if this is the last uh, event. Nicole, is this the last one we're going to do in this building? So uh, most of you know that we are moving to a new building. Uh, uh, we are actually shutting down our offices here uh, two weeks from, uh, from today. It will be our last day in this building. Uh, and then we'll be moving to a new building four blocks away, uh, one that has much taller ceilings in the uh, uh, briefing room. So uh, it'll make me look smaller up on the stage, but uh, that was not the intent. Um, uh, so this will be our last one here, but we'll be rolling one out on uh, looking particularly at the Defense Department uh, and, and all of these data, uh, both services and, and products and R&D for DOD uh, after we get to the new building. Um, question, we have two here, um, woman in the back and then man in the front. Hi, I'm Liz Gormiski from Defense Daily. Um, I wanted to go back to some of the DOD information that you had, the uptick in equipment-related services decline in R&D, the fact that they weren't affected by stimulus. Taking all of that together, can you sort of flesh out what's driving that pre-sequestration? Um, I'd have to go back, and I didn't do it for today's uh, uh, session, and look at our DOD report from last year because many of those trends were already underway in the 2011 data that we had. Um, it really didn't occur to me until preparing for this event that there's a possible correlation between the decline in equipment-related services and a recoding, if you will, of, of particular contracts. And there's a couple, I think, a couple big ones we're going to look at and, and see whether that answers that question. So I'll get a card from you and, and maybe uh, send you the email answer to the, email you the answer to that question when, when we're done. Um, but in terms of what it means overall for, for DOD, um, I think that we're really going to have to wait and see what the 13 data show us and the post-sequestration expenditures, if you will, because the spend patterns for 13 were so dramatically different, both in the initial uh, categories where, you know, you had the guidance of spend normally. So in the first quarter of fiscal year 13, DOD was, in fact, not only spending normally, but in some cases spending at a rate faster than would be sustainable under uh, a sequester uh, level, if you will. And, uh, and then you had a drop off of that, and we'll have to see what the fourth quarter data show in terms of how much of there is there a recovery from that, from that drop off and, and how not. I think it's, uh, 
Um, it's too soon to tell until we have the 13 data to be able to see exactly where DOD is and where they're going. Um, in front, yes. Don Klein, Help with Systems of America. Two questions. If they're, one is fairly brief. The other one might be, take a little longer. For your FPDS data for DOD, does that, does that take into account any foreign military sales contracts that are awarded because there's fairly significant uh, contracts that have come out recently? Yes. Okay. Uh, there is a category for foreign military sales we're starting to look at. It is not consistently reported prior to 05. So one uh, thing that we'll be looking at for our future DOD reports are whether in the past it has been consistently reported. But yes, we're seeing some large um, major contracts contributing to DOD. I mean, theoretically, not to digress here too much, but theoretically you could use the congressional notification as a precursor to that and then circle back to see if, if the numbers that are reported are consistent with what was recorded, reported in the uh, that we could certainly use the notifications as a, as a comparison. Uh, in many, many cases, the fiscal year of execution is different than the fiscal year of Absolutely. notification, as you well know. Um, what it does not include, though, is direct military sales that are not uh, government funded, but are government endorsed, sponsored, or part of our overall foreign policy. The, the other question I had is with regard to competition on, on the multiple award contacts. You know, traditionally, you might see four or five companies that are gra granted a hunt hunting license, let's say, to go out and be eligible for award, but then if you start looking at the preponderance of the task orders, the delivery orders, it really narrows down substantially. So on the, on the surface, you have the appearance of competition, but the reality of the actual contract awards may be different. I'm wondering if your data can show you those subtleties in, in let's say, a, a place where a particular contract vehicle had five awardees, but if you went back and actually analyzed where the money was flowing, you might see that only two of the, of the five awardees actually were getting any substantial benefit from those contracts. I, I think that's exactly what you see. I don't know why this thing, does it turn off automatically? I think it turns off when the mic goes on. Ah, yeah. I need to pay more closer attention. This is a this is a new technological integration uh, that, uh, with which I'm not very familiar. Um, I'm going to have to rehearse better for the next one. Sorry. Um, so the chart that we have here, this is uh, chart 16. Uh, you'll see, for example, in, in the right hand category, of Federal Supply Services and other uh, IDVs. Um, over a third just show a single offer, right? Because in fact, that's exactly what it, the situation you're describing. There were multiple competitors for the basic contract. But the individual awards, the individual task orders uh, that come through this are, in fact, uh, only have a single offer. And, uh, and th these data do reflect that, if you will. And then we break that down in the report by the category of professional administrative okay. management, equipment related, and so on. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we're pretty close to the, the end here. If we have no further questions, let me just check and make sure uh, from a, uh, uh, a viewer's point of view. Hmm? Oh, you have one over here. Sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off. No, no problem, sir. Uh, Spencer, any SES government solutions? Um, I was wondering if you examined how commercial satellite uh, communications and MILSATCOM complement one another, and did you find any uh, architectural analysis from the DOD that showed how the two can fill gaps or shortfalls? We haven't done that in context of this report or our contract analysis. Uh, we, we do have some other efforts underway looking at uh, at that both from a regional point of view, particularly uh, uh, PACOM and, and the challenges of bandwidth provision uh, over the Asia-Pacific region with the uh, strategic rebalancing, uh, and also with respect to some of the um, uh, provision of uh, components and, and launch capacity uh, in, in support of, of those efforts. But those are, those are ways away from uh, being briefed out. Thank you, sir. And uh, do you have any update on the congressional concerns regarding state-owned uh, Satellites owned and operated by states of concern. Don't have anything on that. You don't. All nope. right. Thank you. All right. Um, let me just summarize kind of where we see things, if you will. Right. Overall, the government services contract business um, showed a fair amount of growth for the decade of the aughts, but since the peak in '09 and '10, it's coming down uh, f pretty dramatically, almost across the board by every agency, uh, ranging from one percent NASA to. 8% in uh, uh, DOE. 
Um, that is largely driven by um, a stimulus decline, if you will. Uh, we think that that trend's going to accelerate, that the reductions will accelerate. We see that service contract uh, dollars are coming down faster than contract dollars for products. And, uh, um, and as a percentage of total federal spending, services contracts is declining, right? So even as overall federal spending comes down, services contracts are coming down further. Uh, we see a fair amount of competition, but some room for additional competition. It would be logical that that competition would become more cutthroat, if you will, more competitive both in terms of, of uh, individual rates and overall prices. Uh, given that, uh, you know, a pretty good percentage of services contract dollars are awarded under fixed price uh, contracts, we would expect that competition and, and the price to be, uh, be being reflected there. Um, so it's not a rosy picture, if you will. And I think the key thing from our perspective is what looks different when we have the 13 data. Uh, we're going to try to rush, I think, our analysis of FY13 data. One of the things we've done is substantially increased at CSIS um, our capacity to do analysis, both our data storage capacity and our data manipulation capacity. So we can do things now in a couple hours that used to take us a week. Um, and we expect to be able to turn out our updates for FY13 well before September of next year, possibly as soon as uh, uh, February or March of, of next year. And we'll be keeping you all posted as we go along. Um, and in addition, over the next few months, we'll be rolling out a couple of our individual uh, agency uh, summaries, which goes into more detail uh, than this DOD. I don't, I'm not sure we're going to update the de uh, de uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, this fall. We may wait till next year there. I think we're looking at uh, state and AID as well. Okay. So, so that's, uh, that's it from CSIS. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our viewers on the web. And uh, be happy to uh, arrange a time to go into more detail with any of you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.